If you have your Bible today, I'm going to invite you to turn to Acts chapter 11. We'll be reading verses 1 through 18. It's kind of the follow-up sermon to last week when we looked at a passage in Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 11 and beginning with verse 1. Acts 11 and beginning with verse 1. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard the voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord, nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. And then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear at his house and, and said, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles to come to repentance unto life. May God's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his word. There was a man named John who traveled from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, to the little village of Elizabethtown to conduct revival services. When he arrived in Elizabethtown, none of the churches would allow him to come and speak to them. They had known of John's reputation, and they wanted nothing to do with him. Initially, one of the churches thought it might be okay, and they decided it could not be. And so he found the school, the public school, and sought about renting the public school to hold services there. And he was initially given permission to hold services in the school. Then the school board, who were men of the church in the community, said, oh no, we cannot allow this rabble-rouser to conduct services in our school. Now John knew that he had been sent there from God, that God had appointed him to preach the good news and to specifically go to Elizabethtown to preach this gospel, but not being able to find any other place, he went to the tavern. The tavern was the Black Horse Tavern. And he went to the man who owned the Black Horse Tavern and said, Listen, sir, may I rent your facility? and preach revival services here. And the guy said, yes, you may. And so the message went out that services were going to be held in the Black Horse Tavern. And many people came and were saved. It is said that the tavern owner, and this may be allegorical, said, the people were the same, 
the music was different. The Elizabethtown First Church of God was founded in a tavern. Now, the interesting thing about that whole story is the Elizabethtown Church later bought that facility and tore it down to make a parking lot for the current Bethel that is there in Elizabethtown. The people of the church in Elizabethtown wanted nothing to do with John Weinbrenner because he preached a different message than what they were accustomed to hearing. He called men and women to repentance and to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He asked them to pray the sinner's prayer, if you will, and ask Jesus to be their Savior and Lord, something different than what they had been accustomed to in most of the churches in Elizabethtown. Now that was a long time ago, in the 1830s, 1837, when that took place. Peter, who was a devout Jew, a man who was given the birth name Simon, who on one occasion when he was following Jesus up in the region of Caesarea Philippi, the other Caesarea, in Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus asked him, who do people say that I am? Some of the disciples said, well, some say you are John the Baptist. Others say you are Elijah. And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus responded to him, you are Simon, who from this day on will be called Peter. Now, Peter is a small stone. That's what that word means. Petra. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the rock, of course, is the confession of faith. And upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is the same Simon Peter who devoutly followed God, who did his best in his, his following of Jesus, who didn't live a perfect life, who didn't completely understand, but a man who lived his faith to the best of his ability, who on one occasion said to Jesus, I'll go with you wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I will stand beside you no matter what happens. And Jesus looked at him and smiled and said, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. That night when Jesus was arrested out in the garden, Peter followed from a distance and stood at the courtyard, warming himself at the fire. The young lady asked him the question, aren't you one of them? No, I'm not. And a little while later, she saw him again and said, Surely you were with him. And again, Peter denies. And now the crowd gets into it and said, Listen, you must be with him, for you're a Galilean. Peter cursed. And at that moment, the rooster crowed for the second time. Peter realized that he had denied Jesus. This is the same Peter who after the resurrection is restored into the fullness of his strength by the Lord himself. When he asked him the question, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter goes on to become one of the pillars of the church. Not a perfect man. Just like all of us. But one who has been forgiven. And restored. Last week we saw that Peter was up in Caesarea, this Caesarea there by the sea. And he goes to the house 
of Cornelius, and he shares with him the gospel. And Cornelius, who is the commander of the Italian regiment, a Gentile, comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit descends upon him. And now Peter is on his way back to Jerusalem. And when he gets there, the church just rejoices that there are converts. No. Instead, the church says, Peter, what have you done? I understand that you went into the house of an uncircumcised man and you ate with him. Many years ago, one of the churches that I was serving, we had a youth group that met on Sunday evening. Most of the kids in the youth group were not from the church. They were community kids who came because it was a safe place to come. We had a Bible study with them. We played games with them. We had activities for them, and we always had food. The youth group grew from about 15 people when it got started to about 75 kids every Sunday night. Of those 75 kids, about 10 of them attended church anywhere. 65 of them had no church affiliation whatsoever. And so we began working with them and encouraging them and all of those kinds of things, and we finally convinced them that they needed to come to church on Sunday morning. I'll never forget the very first Sunday morning that they came. They came and they sat in all of the front rows until they filled up every row in the front. Of course, the church was really glad because no one else wanted to sit up front. (laughs) I was thrilled. Seventy-five youth in attendance. And after the service was over that day, I I heard two of the church members talking to one another in the sanctuary. Isn't it awful? Those kids came wearing blue jeans. Isn't it awful that they didn't come wearing appropriate clothing to church? They came wearing blue jeans. Jesus on one occasion says, sometimes we strain the gnats and swallow the camel. We miss the point. Peter was willing to go wherever God had asked him to go and to do whatever God had asked him to do. And he went with a little bit of fear and trepidation in his heart. And that's okay. When Peter has this vision of the sheet and all the good stuff in it, ham loaf, John. (laughs) When John was in the hospital and I went to visit him, I walked in and I said, is this anything that ham loaf will cure? (laughs) And the Lord says to him, rise and eat. Peter says, I can't eat that stuff, that's unclean. And the second time it comes down, rise and eat. I can't eat that. Nothing impure has ever entered my mouth. I'm sure that's a lie. I don't know whether anything impure entered it, but I'm pretty sure something impure left it. And the third time God lowers the sheet, rise and eat. I can't eat that. That's impure. And God said, what I've made pure, you should not consider to be impure. question for you and me today is this. Are there people in our lives who we know who are impure? Who need Jesus? Who will tell them?
when we go to share the good news with them, there, will there be any fear and trepidation in our heart? Sure. Will God go with us? You bet he will. And if you and I don't go and share, who will? I grew up in church. You all know that. I, Mom and Dad took us to church every time the doors of the church were open. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, the doors of the church were open. We were there. We had revival services. We were there. We had a special service of any kind, a missionary coming in or whatever. We were there. We were always in church. I knew exactly everything there was to know about church, except I didn't know Jesus. I knew about Jesus. I could tell you the story of Jesus' birth. I could tell you a lot of the Sunday school stories. I could sing deep and wide and Jesus loves me and anything else you wanted me to. I knew how to dress for church. My brother got me in trouble on a few occasions when he challenged me to things and I could always stand the challenge. He'd say, Mike, why don't you jump at the creek? Maybe, maybe we won't have to go to church tonight then. I jumped right in the creek. Thought nothing of it. We both got a spanking, changed our clothes, and went to church. <laughs> Didn't help us any. I knew you had three kinds of clothing in life. You had Sunday clothes, you had school clothes, and you had everyday clothes. Or play clothes. And I knew when you went to church you wore your Sunday clothes. I knew what it looked like to be a Christian. I knew how you spoke if you were a Christian. I knew what words you used and couldn't use if you were a Christian. I knew that you couldn't play softball on Sunday afternoons if you were a Christian. I knew the rules. Didn't follow them real well. But I knew them. Sunday afternoons, my dad, if we weren't visiting somewhere, visiting family, dad watched the Phillies broadcast. The reason we watched the Phillies broadcast because it was the one TV station we got. <clears throat> and back in the day, the Phillies broadcast was... Sponsored by Ballantine Beer. Now, I also knew if you're a Christian, you didn't drink beer or wine or any other strong drink. So, was it okay to watch the Phillies broadcast or not? Well, they had a catchy jingle. One Sunday evening, I was about five or six years old, I guess, and my cousin and I, she was about my same age. We graduated from high school together. I guess we were kind of talking to each other as the service was getting ready to start or whatever, and we broke into the jingle. <laughs> hey, get your cold beer, get your cold brewed Valentine beer. <laughs> Apparently, you shouldn't do that when you're five or six years old. We got hauled out. <laughs> the question is, what about people out there who don't know the right thing to wear, the right thing to do, the right thing to say? Who will tell them? If not us. Who will share Jesus with them? 
if we don't. Now, my mother practiced uh, child psychology, not professionally, but just with three sons. With two of them, she was very successful. The third one was a challenge for her. You know, mom would say to me, if all your friends go jump in the lake, are you going to jump in the lake too? I'd already been in the creek. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to jump in the lake. It didn't quite work. Mike, beware of the company you keep. I knew what she meant by that. But don't they need Jesus? Aren't we glad for a man like John Weinbrenner who would go into a tavern and hold services? Aren't we glad for kids who will come and sit in the front of a church wearing blue jeans on a Sunday morning? Every one of us here needs to be a little stone, just like Simon Peter. To be a part of the house of God that the Lord is building to be used and useful in the building of the church. Because I promise you, you know somebody who will never darken the door of that church unless you bring them. I didn't go to college in my first year out of high school. By the way, I do recommend you do that. I just didn't. And that wasn't because of my rebellion, although it could have been Patrice. And during that year I worked, and one of the things that I did was run these big equipment that were called slitter rewinders. It was in the paper industry, these big machines that rolled paper and cut it to different widths and rolled it to different diameters and whatever. All of our machinery was very old. And one day, a piece of my machine broke. And all I had were pieces. Put them in a little wood, you know, a little wooden box. And I took him down to the local machine shop to see if the guy could make me a new, whatever it was, piece. If we could put that all back together and he could make me one because you couldn't buy it. Walked into this machine shop. The doors and windows are all open because it's summertime and it's hot. and, And machines are running, but I don't see anybody. And I call out, hey, is anybody here? And the guy hollers, yeah, in the back, come on in. Still can't see him. So I go in, carrying my little box, looking for this man whose voice I could hear, and I get back there, and there's a man who doesn't look like a churchman. He looks like a biker. He had long hair down to here and long beard down to here. He had a T-shirt on didn't have sleeves in it. They were ripped out. And he had tattoos that went from here to somewhere. (laughs) Now this is 1977. People didn't have tattoos. People didn't wear long hair and long beards and all those kinds of things. And this guy's back there on his hands and knees and he has a, a, a little piece of metal about the size of a pencil. And he has this whole pile of metal shavings and he's sorting his way through. I'm standing there holding my wooden box. I'm a little scared of this man. Because he looks rough. I'm not even sure I want to ask him, can you make me, you know, whatever I need here? And he, and he doesn't look up at me at all. He's sorting through this pile of metal shavings, and he says, I'll be with you in a minute. I said, Okay. So he takes his little piece of metal and he's sorting his way through. And finally he reaches in 
And he pulls out, obviously, the thing that he's looking for. A little piece of metal. He's on his knees. And he looks up at me and said, Jesus gives me all the grace I need. Now, I thought I might hear Jesus being mentioned by looking at this guy. But I wasn't sure it was going to be in the appropriate context in which he shared it. Jesus gives me all the grace I need. This man didn't look like he knew Jesus. In my preconceived understanding of what a Christian should look like. Who was the man who needed Jesus that day? Me. Because I'm standing there bringing judgment upon this man based upon how he is dressed and how he looks. Not based upon his heart. You probably know somebody who needs Jesus. They might even look the part. They might be all nice and clean and so on on the outside of their life. But not so good on the inside. Who will tell them? When Peter went to Jerusalem, He explained to the believers everything that had happened. That he had been directed by the Holy Spirit to go to Cornelius. That he shared the message of the gospel with Cornelius and Cornelius believed and was baptized that day. And then the Jewish believers rejoiced. Wow. It's not just about looking good, acting good, being circumcised or not circumcised. None of those things matter. It's about where your heart is. There are people that you and I know who are going to die apart from Jesus unless we tell them. Heavenly Father, thank you this day for who you are. Thank you for the fact that someone shared Jesus with us. Thank you for the good news that has come into our hearts and into our minds. Thank you for a man like Peter who was willing to be bold and to go and to share the good news with Cornelius. He was willing to defend his actions to those who did not yet understand. O Lord, help us to be willing. In Jesus' name, amen.